Well, salvation truly do belong to, to our God. And I think every one of us would say amen and amen. And, and as I said, we, we are as a church are really those who have been saved um, by God. This is, uh, uh, the, the, the church is made up of the, of the redeemed. And uh, <clears throat> we have been giving thanks over this past month for various aspects really of, of, our, of our salvation and uh, Last week, we, we gave thanks to the Lord for, for just um, His example in, in submission. And so this week, uh, we want to just give thanks to the Lord for really for the sovereignty of God in salvation, that He has sanctioned the servant <clears throat> to be uh, a sacrifice on our behalf. And so really, we want to come this morning again and just bless the Lord. Uh, as the psalmist says, bless the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. And the people of God says, Amen. And Ephesians 1 verse 3 and 4 tells us that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. And God's people says, Amen. 1 Peter 1 3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And God's people says, Amen. <clears throat> and we really ought to bless God in, uh, for who is the uh, because He is the author of our salvation, as it is as, be, as it has been accomplished by the servant, as sanctioned by the Father. And we are in uh, Isaiah fifty three, the the final servant song in the book of Isaiah, uh, in the final stanza of the final song. And we've already seen uh, in this uh, passage, starting from uh, 52 verse 13, uh, all the way through, we've seen uh, the success of the servant, we've seen, looked at the scorn of the servant, we've looked at the substitute of the servant, we have looked at the submission of the servant, and today the, the sanction of the servant. Our salvation uh, as worked by the servant was sanctioned by God. It was, it was decreed by God. It was, it was ordained by God. Uh, the fact that we are a church, the fact that, that we are His children is because God sanctioned that, ordained that. And so every Christian believer must be thankful, or ought to be thankful, because of the blessings that has been brought about through the work of, of the servant. And so today in verses 10 to 12 of Isaiah 53, uh, we want to just look at uh, what the servant did and the blessings that came from that, or the results that, is, that came from that. And each, each of these verses states what the servant had done uh, and also what the consequences is. And so because the, the Lord sanctioned the servant's sacrifice, believers are children of God. And because the Lord sanctified the servant's suffering, Believers are justified, and because the Lord sanctioned the servant's service, believers will, will reign with him. So let me read these three verses for us, and, and then we'll pray before we continue. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and will divide the booty with the strong. 
because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you, Lord, in acknowledgement of our need and a need of, of you to and your spirit to work in us and through us, through your word, Lord. We know that that uh, the word is the ministry of the spirit. And uh, Lord, through it, you accomplish your purposes. And we pray, Lord, that that will be so in us this morning as we sit under the hearing of your word. Uh, may you be blessed and honored, glorified, Lord, as you build us up as you edify us as you strengthen us lord uh, by your grace i pray in jesus name amen and so the lord was pleased to crush him and uh, put him to grief now this this pleasing the Lord was this should not be understood as a as him experiencing some kind of a sadistic pleasure in 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 tormenting uh, the servant. No, this this please was was uh, was to do with his his will that that he approved of what uh, the servant had to go through. He actually ordained what he had to suffer. He sanctioned it. The the crushing of the servant. And the putting him to, to grief was according to God's predetermined plan. This is how he chose he, to deal with sin in order to, to justify the sinner, in order to make sinners his children, in order to establish his dominion over this sin-cursed world again. And it pleased God that the death of the servant would pay the price demanded by his holy righteousness uh, to make things right, to make reparation for the damage that sin has caused and to remove the guilt of sin and to enable us to enjoy a, a new relationship uh, with, uh, with God. And so, so he gave this prophecy, um, really after reading all of what has gone before, uh, these last few verses, uh, God gave the prophecy through Isaiah to make sure that we would understand that this was not just a, a set of unfortunate events, that this is not just something that, that was a bit of an accident, that the Savior had suffered in this way, but that he planned it that he ordained it, that, that it was his will for this to take place. And yes, sinful men were the ones guilty of inflicting the suffering uh, on, on, the, on the servant. But the supreme cause behind this whole uh, thing that the, that the servant suffered was God. He caused it. He made the sin of men subservient to his good pleasure, his will, his predetermined counsel. And we, and we read more about that in Acts uh, 2 when, when Peter was addressing uh, the people at, at, on the day of Pentecost. He said to them, this man, referring to Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death and so we see God's uh, action of preordination planning sanctioning it but men were the ones who carried it out and this was of course planned and sanctioned before the foundation of the world revelations 13 8 tells us um, and god's plan of salvation this this immense demonstration of his love this the, the punishment of sin the the redemption and reconciliation of sinners to himself uh, the, really the establishment of his kingdom uh, required the removal of guilt. Um, guilt from sinful people in order to form a holy people. Uh, and so the Lord was 
was pleased to crush him. Verse 5 of the chapter says, For our iniquities, uh, for our transgressions, uh, God calls our iniquities to, to fall upon him. And the Lord was pleased to put him to grief. Literally, we've, we've mentioned this before, that grief here is the word sickness. Uh, and so literally it means here that, that the Lord was pleased to make him sick, or rather to inflict injury upon him uh, in payment of the penalty for sin, to exact from him the payment that is due because of our sin dead. And so the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. When he offered him his soul up as a guilt offering. Now, now if we read of, of a guilt offering for the first time in Leviticus chapter 5 and, uh, and 6, and there was one of five sacrifices that an Israelite had and could bring in order to maintain his relationship, his fellowship with God. We, of course, had the burnt offering, which essentially was an offering that was brought because of uh, uh, the worshippers' adoration. Uh, it was a worship offering. It was, it was expressing adoration to God. Then there were two peace offerings. There was a grain offering and a meal offering. Both of them were peace offerings. And they were they were brought as, as really as fellowship offerings, uh, as, as uh, offerings that, that you bring in order to consecrate yourself, to sanctify yourself unto the Lord. Um, then there was the sin offering that, of course, was brought to, to, to make atonement for sin. And then the guilt offering. The guilt offering was to make restitution. Uh, restitution for the damage that sin has caused. Uh, it was paying for your, your guilt, uh, for making things right. And, and when, it, when, 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 it, when there was that sin involved another person, you would have to bring an offering to the Lord, and then you would have to make right the person whom you have sinned against. So, so if you have defrauded your neighbor, you would sacrifice to God, uh, and a sacrifice an animal, and then you had to repay what you have defrauded your, your, your neighbor with and add 20% in compensation. So really the idea here is the, the guilt offering was, was uh, to repay your debt, your, your guilt, the, the damage that, 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 that your sin have, have caused. And, and what's, what's different from the guilt, uh, about the guilt offering to the others was, was really the, the insistence of exactness, of a minute exactness. It had to be precisely what, you have, what damage you have caused, you need to put right. You need to... to uh, to make restitution for. And, and we, we, under, we understand this, of course. Uh, we, as, as humans made in the image of God, are very aware of moments or times when people wrong us. If people have done something wrong against, if they steal something from us, they need to pay for that. They need to make right. If, 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 if some, maybe, maybe even at work, if you... Um, uh, got injured because of negligence uh, at work, you know what? They need to pay me some compensation for, for, for this. Uh, even relationships, when, when in a relationship a spouse may be betrayed, their trust may be betrayed, they may have been adultery, you know what? The offended party feels that the guilty one should pay for what he or she did. We can't just let this go. It has to be made right. Someone has to pay for this. The same with when, even when there's false rumors or, or slander or gossip being spread around. You, you want them to make it right. So you make a claim of, for, uh, again, or for defamation, for character assassination or whatever. You, and you see compensation. You want them to make it right. That this is not true. And so what happens is we as people are very quick to, to demand our right for compensation, our right for, for a wrong to be corrected. Uh, but when it comes to, to God, uh, we are often silent 
about his right for compensation for our sin, for him to exact payment for our sin. People are quick to, to blame God for being a vindictive, angry God who just wants to punish people for all eternity for the smallest little sin that, they, that they've committed. But they don't realize that their sin is an insult to God's character. It's, it's an offense to him, to his person, an infinite offense. And God demands... His holiness demands, His righteousness demands that that be put right. And that's why a guilt offering was, was first introduced, I believe, in, in, the, in the Mosaic sacrificial system. And here we find Christ is the one who really paid exactly what was required to remove our guilt to remove our, our debt that we owed the Lord. He, he, he really functioned as compensation for us, as restitution to God for the damages done against Him by our sin, by us. So every rebellious act, act every iniquitous sin, that is what led the servant to be crushed to be pierced, to suffer and die on the cross so that your debt and my debt and all those who have come to Christ asking Father to apply His guilt offering to my life and your life so that we don't have to pay that debt. And so the question is, do you have outstanding debt? Have you received the servant's guilt offering on your behalf? And scripture is clear, the way you do that is by coming to him in repentant faith, confessing that yes, I am guilty of these sins. Confessing, yes, I can't pay the penalty. And believing that Christ did it. And did it sufficiently for you. And when you do, your debt is canceled. You are released from that. But should you refuse to do that, then that means you are still guilty. And God will exact full payment, exact retribution for every offense, every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, every hideous assault on His holy character. That will be exacted from you. But it pleased him to crush the servant, to put him to grief in payment for our guilt, for our sin. But for us and for those who have received him, who have benefited from his guilt offering, we will also partake in the blessings that is bestowed upon him because of that. Because that verse continues, he says, if he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see offspring or seed. Uh, literally meaning he will see, he will have many children. Uh, children, of course, this is, Christ did not have children. The servant did not have children. Uh, so this talks about spiritual children, those children who have believed that he is their guilt offering, those who've come to him in repentant faith. And it's only those who have done that, that have received him, to them is given the right 
to be children of God, as, as, first John, as, as John 1 uh, tells us. Not born of blood, meaning not because of your heritage or because of your family name or history. Not, because, not, because, not born of the will of the flesh. Not because you wanted to be and you make yourself to be a child of God. Not born of the will of man. Somebody else can't make you a child of God. But born of God through the regeneration of his, of his spirit. And just a, a couple of chapters before, we read in, in Isaiah 49 about Zion who was uh, bereft of, of her children. And then there will come a time when, when there will be so many, she will have so many children that, that the city would be overcrowded. And, and in verse 21 of, of Isaiah 49, this question is asked, where did all these children come from? Well, here we find the answer, that he will see his seed, that those who will be made children of God through faith in Christ, who have benefited from the, the guilt offering that the servant brought, they will be the children of God. It goes on, he says that he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days. Now, of course, we know the servant who is Christ Jesus died. He was sacrificed. It's, 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 it's stated for us here that if he would render himself a guilt offering, he will prolong his days. He will live many days. And, and we know that the servant died. He was about 30, 33 years of age when, when, when Christ was crucified. And so though it, uh, not uh, explicitly stated here in, in this verse, this hints to his resurrection. That on the third day after he's been crucified, after, after the guilt offering has been brought, he was raised to life. And then for about 40 days, he appeared to his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God before he ascended uh, to heaven. And the truth is that the death of the servant, by the will of God, did not end his ministry. He is alive. He lives, and he is active in his church. We read that in, in Revelations, Revelation 1, 17, 18, around there, when, when we read that, that, uh, that he, the exalted Christ, was walking among the lampstands, representing the churches. And then he told the Apostle John, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So, so the servant will prolong his days in that he, though he was slain, he was raised to life and is ascended and, uh, to heaven. And though he was slain, he is now active as the head of the church, fulfilling really the good pleasure of the Lord. The good pleasure, it says there, of the Lord will prosper in his hand. That is a, another result um, of his sacrifice. And, and in essence, what, what, the, what the servant's sacrifice enabled was this ongoing realization of the purposes of God. An increasing realization of the purposes of of God according to the Father's predetermined counsel as He sanctioned it, as He wills it, as, he, as it is his, that would bring Him pleasure. You, we remember uh, back in Isaiah 42 and 49 where there were two other servant songs and there God's intended purposes for the servant were announced. And uh, that he was going to be the one who will bring forth justice. He will establish justice in the earth. Uh, and, and you may remember we said that that is he will establish his word on earth. What he ultimately would, would say and, and command and do his will in his way, that is what will be established on earth. Um, that he is the one who will be a covenant to the people. Um, we, of course, know that the new covenant. Uh, he will be a light to the nations. He will be the one who opened blind eyes and set captives free and, and bring salvation of God even to the ends of the earth. 
And because the servant was obedient in the sanctioned or to the sanctioned will of God by rendering himself a guilt offering, uh, the predetermined purposes of God is being fulfilled even in our day to day. And so because of his sacrifice, uh, we can become children of God. Believers can become children of God through whom the purposes of God is accomplished as Christ works in and through his church. The second thing is we, we can be thankful because the Lord sanctioned the suffering of the servant so that believers are justified. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. And so the servant who it was the one who, who had full knowledge, had full knowledge of, of God. He knew the will of God. He knew the love of God. He knew the grace of God, the, the mercy of God. The perfect righteousness of God, the perfect justice of God, the the penalty that God requires for sin. He had full knowledge of that. And he lived precisely, perfectly in accordance to that, that knowledge. He lived, therefore, a sinless, blameless life. And then he offered himself up as this perfect sinless sacrifice, uh, bearing our iniquities. And so this justification, he says, uh, he will justify the many. My servant will justify the many. And of course, justification, we know, is a Christian term that is drawn from the legal world that really declares someone who has been guilty innocent because of their debt that has been paid. And not only has their debt been paid, they have been given the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. Of God in Christ. And that is, that is the wonder of the gospel. That's the wonder of, of the Christian faith is that those who are guilty, those who are wicked, those who are undeserving of all mercy are being given righteousness, are declared innocent, are, de- are said to be holy, are said to be saints because of what Christ has done, because of what the servant has done. That he, it's not only that your account is cleared of all debt, but it is filled up with perfect righteousness of Christ. So justification means when God looks at you, he sees righteousness, Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Incredible, incredible truth of the gospel of Christ. And the servant can look with satisfaction on his life because of this. They look back and you can look at his suffering and the anguish of his soul. But the result of that, the satisfaction that comes from that is many are justified. Not all. Scripture does not teach universalism in salvation. But, but many. And so again, the question is, have you been justified? Have you been declared righteous? Has your penalty been paid? Your debt settled? Because if not, you you still owe really an unpayable debt that even an eternity in hell will not be able to repay because we've sinned against an infinite God. And there's only one way we can be right with God, one way that we can be justified before Him, and that is when we come by faith, believing in what the servant had done. Now, 
I think all of us, or most people, I would imagine, wants their lives to mean something. Uh, we, we want, we want uh, our lives to count for something. We want it to be significant. I don't think I've ever met someone who just said, no, I just want to live and die and nobody should know that I even existed. Uh, everybody wants to, to leave their mark in some way on, on this earth. Um, I'm, I'm told that the new status or the criteria for, 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 for status among the super rich is no longer how much money you have. It's not your net worth that they compare each other on. It's actually how much you have given away, which is actually good in one sense, uh, provided the motives, of, of course, are, are, are right. But really, now, now, now the boast among the super rich is, listen, I have given away a million dollars. Or the other one, I've actually given away a billion dollars. That's the new criteria for, for status. Uh, and, and, and people do those kinds of things to, to feel good about themselves, to feel satisfied about their lives. They're looking for, for meaning, for significance, for, for impact in their life. Now, the Savior has given His life to justify many. And I would suggest to you that a life spent making that known to others is what will truly satisfy. That if we tell people of what Christ has done and that they can be right with God on the basis of what He has done, that is what is significant. That is what will make your life significant, not only in this life, but in the life to come. When we are faithful to the Lord in what He has commanded us to do, which is to proclaim the gospel. And so because the Lord sanctioned the servant's sacrifice, we can be His children. Because the Lord sanctioned His suffering, we are justified. And because the Lord sanctioned the servant's service, we will reign with Him. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors the Lord triumph at the moment of what appears to be the greatest defeat was his greatest victory. When, when we read that he uh, put to shame all the rulers and authorities, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through, uh, up on the cross. And these words are words of, of victory. This is uh, the Lord uh, sp speaking of His reign, of, of His rule, that, that it's like a, like a king that has conquered others. He will uh, enjoy the spoils of His victory. We will enjoy that with the strong. Um, and of course, this world at the moment is under the sway of Satan. And therefore, in opposition to its rightful ruler. But Isaiah reminds us here that the servant will conquer. He has conquered. And he will ultimately completely defeat his enemies. And he will establish his rule and his reign over them. We read of that in Psalm 2, Psalm 2, verse 7. If you want to, you can turn there, uh, where the psalmist just explains how the servant or the, or, the, or the Messiah will rule. Verse 7 says, I will surely tell you of the decree of the Lord, that which God has sanctioned, that which He has ordained, that He has determined by His preordained counsel. 
He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And later on in Isaiah, and Isaiah 60, uh, really again talking about the tribute that the kings will bring to their servant king in Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah 60.10 tells us, The foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, this is I struck Jerusalem, and in my favor, and of course servant, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. And so indeed, he will have a portion among the great. He will share or enjoy the booty, the spoils of victory um, with the strong with those whom he, who will be with him at that time. And that is the promise that is inherent in this, this, this verse, is that those who are with him, those who have overcome, those who persevere, will reign with Christ. We, we read of that, of course, in Romans 8, 17, when it says that we are children of God, and as children we are heirs of God and, and fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Now Isaiah then goes on and tells us, having, having, having declared to us the victory of the servant, why would he achieve this? Because of the service that he rendered unto God. It says, because he poured out himself to death. The servant held nothing back. We read in, in, in Philippians 2, verse 5 and the following, that have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of as, as a man, he humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so the, the servant stepped out of his glory in heaven into creation. He laid aside the independent, voluntary use of his divine attributes to take on flesh. And he humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. An amazing display of, of humility and love. And because he did that, he will reign. Are we not called to do the same? It says there, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus says he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his ransom for many. Are we not called to do likewise? And as we do, and to the extent that we do, we will reign with him. He was numbered with the transgressors. While, while during his ministry, he was called a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, Luke 7.34. And please note that he had compassion on these people, but he did never partake or partook in, his, in their sin. 
He was rejected in favor of a murderous man, Barabbas. He was crucified between robbers. He was indeed numbered with the transgressors. But God vindicated him, as we saw last week in verse 9. He had a heart for the loss, but no appetite for their sin. Are we not to imitate him in that? He bore the sin of many. At his birth, he was announced that his name should be Jesus because he will save the people from their sin. John the Baptist identified him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he was, of course, crucified for the sins of many. He died for the sins of many. Now, are we not called to take that message to the world? And he interceded for transgressors on the cross in excruciating pain, in, with unimaginable suffering. He looked at those who was nailing the nails into his hands, and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He interceded for them. And when he rose to life and he ascended to heaven, that's where he now intercedes for us even to this day. Romans 8, 34 tells us, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Hebrews 7, 25 tells us that he is our high priest who forever lives and makes intercession for us. First John 2, 1 tells us that He is our advocate who pleads our case really before the Father. Are we not called to pray, to intercede for the lost, for the saints? This is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with Him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And so because of his faithful servant, his successful ministry, the servant was allotted a portion with the great and he would enjoy the booty with the strong sanctioned by the Lord by God's will the servant had to suffer so that we may become children of him that we may become just become justified through him that we may reign with him. Let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word and, Lord, your salvation. Lord, salvation is truly from you, our Lord. And we, we give you thanks for that, Lord. We, we pray, Father, that if there are those who have not been justified and who are not children with, of you, Lord, here this morning, that you would minister to them through your Spirit. Lord, that you would convict them of their sin, convict them of their need for a Savior, convict them and persuade them, Lord, of your provision. And Lord, help them to believe, to believe the truth to believe the gospel, that salvation is from you, and it's only through Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.